Uh, we will continue with um, Andrea. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Um, hello. He uh, will talk about serving Earth observation data with GeoSurvey server. Sorry, and um, he works in the GeoSolution group. He's an open source enthusiast and with strong experience in Java development and GIS. Uh, so let's hear him out. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about serving Earth observation data with GeoServer, in particular CogStack, OpenSearch, and more. First, a uh, quick description of my company. Uh, GeoSolutions is based in Italy, but we also have offices in the United States and uh, customers uh, worldwide. Uh, we are a technical uh, company with uh, 25 plus engineers out of 30 people involved in the company. We support uh, GeoServer, G Map Store, GeoNode, and GeoNetwork, and uh, we offer a bunch of uh, different uh, um, contracts like enterprise support services, deployment subscription, customized solutions, and professional training. We believe strongly in open source, and we believe in open standards, so we are also part of uh, uh, OGC as a member and uh, work on in test beds and code sprints. And we try to support also uh, standards critical to GeoInt. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, well, say that we have a, a bunch of uh, um, raster data uh, that comes from a variety of sources, remote sensing, uh, meteorological uh, forecast methods, uh, models, sorry, uh, in situ observations, uh, drones, and whatnot. And uh, we would like to uh, serve it to the world and do something sensible with it how to go about it with GeoServer. So first of all, let's talk about uh, locating the raster sources. In our scenario, we suppose that we are going to have uh, lots of raster data. So thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions or tens of millions of uh, single raster files that we need to uh, deliver to uh, the users in a sensible way. So uh, the first answer to this kind of request was uh, back in 2017, that's when we implemented it uh, for GeoServer for the first time, uh, was OpenSearch for EO. Uh, OpenSearch for EO is a, uh, well, a search engine uh, functionality based on the OpenSearch, what used to be OpenSearch.org when it was not owned by uh, Amazon. So an, an, uh, an open source uh, specification uh, for search engines, uh, not an Elasticsearch uh, clone. And uh, <clears throat> OpenSearch for EO is a profile of that uh, effort that adds uh, a notion of uh, geography, time, and uh, uh, Earth observation specific uh, properties. So uh, the general information schema of the, the service and also the database that's, that sits behind it is based on collections collections own items and uh, when it comes to GeoServer in particular we also have a table for what we call granules which are the single raster files making up a product. Products can be as simple as a single file but they can also be complicated like for example if I have a Sentinel-2 image then it's probably going to be 13 different uh, files one per band because they tend to be at different resolutions. So in open search, we do typically a two-step search. First, we find the collection of similar products that we are interested in too, and say something like, okay, do I want optical data or radar data? Uh, do I want high or low resolution, uh, old or new, and so on? And then once I found the, the right collection, I can search the products in it by using uh, time, space, but also all the uh, Earth observation-related uh, properties such as cloud cover, snow cover, and so on. This is a sample search. Uh, the URL that you can see here has uh, the notion of uh, searching uh, apparent ID, Sentinel-2, and uh, getting anything that has a cloud cover less than 30%. The result is a GeoRSS output, which uh, browser used to, to format directly, not anymore because uh, GeoRSS went uh, a little out of favor, and RSS in general. Um, in order to uh, modernize uh, this, uh, this approach, a, a few years ago, OGC also released a binding for GeoJSON outputs, which we also implement. Uh, GeoServer implements the GeoJSON uh, for OpenSearch 
output uh, since uh, a few months ago. What's in the output? Well, uh, in the output, we have links to metadata, uh, like ISO or GML observation and measurement uh, sheets, but also links to OGC services, where you can find the information about the particular product or collection, such as looking at it with WMS or downloading masks with WFS or extracting raw raster data with WCS. Also, in 2021, we implemented on top of the same database the, uh, a Stack API. Stack API is, uh, again, a search engine of sort uh, based on OGC API features uh, with uh, um, a specification that qualifies in a, very in a more precise way how the items, the features that, that, the, uh, that the server is providing are structured. So it, it tells you which properties you should have for radar data, for uh, uh, optical data, and so on. And it also allows for cross-collection searches through the um, search resource, which is something uh, new and uh, compared to open search where you have to go to two steps. Uh, here are some screenshots from the um, service that uh, DLR EOC GeoService uh, which is a, um, an implementation of Stack API with GeoServer is doing right now. The, the service is currently in development beta, so don't assume everything is finished here. But they basically took our basic templates and customized them to give them uh, um, a better look and feel, at least for, for their use case, and uh, uh, exposing more properties. So this is the landing page. This is the list of collections. We see some Sentinel-2 data. Uh, this is uh, the description of one collection uh, with uh, assets for downloads. We see uh, a list of items which are single images, uh, again with a long list of properties that you wouldn't find in a, a basic implementation of uh, GServer Stack API. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, more information about the single item, in particular all the assets. Uh, the assets are uh, links to the components that make up the, the product, that is all the files, like uh, the imagery itself, but, that, but also the masks and, and so on. Now, uh, we have a common database, then we have OpenSearch for EO with the GRSS output and the stack collections and the OpenSearch EO for GeoJSON, and we have a problem. Each uh, of these four components talks about uh, uh, the same properties with different names. So what we have in the database uh, doesn't match one-to-one -one what we have in the outputs. Um, and also the database is customizable, so uh, it's not like we can um, uh, hard code in, 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 uh, in GeoServer the transformations. Instead, we went with an approach based on templates. So there is a plugin called Feature Templating in GeoServer that allows to map from uh, one model to another. And we used it uh, to build the uh, GeoJSON, HTML, and GRSS outputs for both Stack and OpenSearch. The templates are used both in the outgoing direction to build the, the right representation of items from, um, from the database contents, but also backwards. Uh, as you do queries, you query using uh, pro uh, property names typical of that service of stack of open search and it, they map back to the properties property names that are used in the, the database this is more or less how a template looks like as you can see it's a valid json document with some dollar uh, uh, curly brace uh, expansions here and there that can be used to expand uh, uh, property values call uh, functions uh, filter elements and so on it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, development. I invite you to join us for the State of GeoServer presentation tomorrow that, and where are we talking about it uh, a little more. Finally, uh, the, the information in the database can be maintained through a REST API where you can uh, create and destroy collections, create and destroy uh, products and uh, their metadata and publish layers out of them. So. Uh, with this in mind, let's move to accessing raster data. So let's say that we have located the, the, the images that I want. How do I go about accessing them? With some tools nowadays, you can just uh, follow the links and uh, uh, 
access directly from the client side. Uh, but uh, uh, it's also possible to use WMS services and the like. Now, uh, these links typically go to the files, which are either uh, files on the local file system, which is the classic approach, but more and more we see uh, imagery either sitting on an HTTP server or uh, on a S3 uh, bucket or some other kind of blob storage. How do we go about reading from blob stores? Well, presently there are two choices. Uh, they are both for, uh, for S3. Uh, one is the old S3 GeoTIFF plugin from Boundless, and uh, the new one is the COG plugin. The old S3 GeoTIFF plugin was do just doing range reads, uh, HTTP range reads in blocks of five megabytes from the remote HTTP server, and in particular from a a S3. And uh, uh, it was working with whatever layout uh, of the GeoTIFF you could uh, you could use. It's uh, it's a good thing to have because there are so many files still positioned in blob stores that are not COG optimized yet. However, this plugin is uh, going to be replaced by the new COG plugin, which uh, uh, just reads a bit from the header and then leverages the structure of a COG to only read the the bits. Uh, that are needed from the tiles. So it locates the tiles that we want, uh, coalesces their addresses into seamless uh, spaces, and then downloads them. So this is pretty efficient. At the moment, we can do that against S3. I'm going to start working next week on uh, the same for Google Storage. Uh, we also can uh, use a generic, generic HTTP server and uh, we might get in, uh, caching down the way. Okay, that solves the problem of uh, um, accessing a single file. How do we go about composing them in a, a larger mosaic? Well, GeoServer and GeoTools have had this uh, image mosaicing plugin for a while, which is based on an index. The index basically contains the footprint of an image, its location, and eventually other properties that we can use to filter and sort on. Uh, the the mosaicing plugin nowadays allows you to have almost complete freedom. The images can be variously over, overlapping the way you want, different uh, use different file formats, uh, be in different color models, and be in different coordinate reference systems. So you can mix and match pretty much whatever you want in a single image mosaic. As I said, the mosaic index is used to uh, to drive the image composition. And we have a bunch of places where you can store it, from a simple shape file to databases. And uh, also, uh, there is an interface for it, so you can build your own, which is something that we did when integrating with uh, already existing uh, image catalogs uh, at customer sites. Uh, we were talking about uh, potentially having other properties. Yes, we can have other properties in the index. Most common ones are time and elevation, which allows us to, to filter based on the um, on a uh, time frame or a dimension frame. But also, uh, we could have other properties, and in particular, the EO properties. So we also have uh, uh, built a tighter relationship between our open search engine and image mosaic in such a way that you can define uh, layers based on the contents of, uh, of the um, uh, open search catalog or stack catalog. And you have uh, REST APIs that you can call to build these layers. And then these layers will be powered by your um, catalog and will have access to all the properties that a, a, an image has so that you can uh, I don't know, display only images with, uh, within a given area, time frame, and uh, cloud cover. Uh, there are other approaches which are interesting. There is this um, image mosaic stack plugin that you can find uh, here on, uh, on GitHub. It's, it's uh, outdated. It's uh, two years old and uh, doesn't seem to be moving anymore. But I think that the concept per se was interesting. Having GeoServer just directly talk to an external stack API and then uh, build image mosaics out of queries that we do against that Stack API. Uh, this, to be viable, needs the Stack API, Stack API to settle down. At the moment, it's still in, uh, in beta. We implement the beta 2. Beta 3 is going to come in with the significant changes in filtering. So it's still kind of difficult to, to pull it off because uh, the Stack API is still a moving target. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting 
interesting concept and I wanted to, to point uh, people to, to it. Uh, along the way, there will be some slides with documentation links. I'm not going to comment over them, but you can uh, refer to them later to find more information about what I'm talking about in the docs of GeoServer. Now, once that we have an image mosaic pointing to our images with all the attributes and so on, we can do fun stuff like filtering and sorting. We can filter by specific properties that we have in the stack index, for example. And we can sort the images uh, by, for example, time to have the most recent on top, or maybe say something else like I want uh, the less cloudy on top and so on. So it allows us to pick the best image, pick it on top and fill the rest with uh, images that we think are uh, of lower value or less interesting. We can do masking in a variety of ways. So if you have images that contain some sort of uh, no data areas, you can use, well, no data itself. You can use a vector mask. You can use a raster masks. Uh, and you can even plug in your own mask provider. So if you needed to uh, clip your images in some way, there are a variety of ways to do it. Do it. It's also interesting that we can take images that um, are made of uh, several different files and pack them together into a virtual image that has all the bands uh, in, a, in a single place. It's uh, very common when we have uh, Sentinel-2, for example, which is made of 13 files, uh, and we wanted to present it as a single seamless 13 bands image. Well, we can do that with uh, the concept of coverage views. Uh, right now, we can just mix and match the, the source bands into a uh, dynamic composition. With time, we hope that we can add also map algebra in between so that you can on the fly compute new information that wasn't there in the, in the original data. Now, now that we have uh, all the tricks uh, figured out in Image Mosaic, how do we visualize the, the results? Well, uh, the classic approach is WMS and WMS with uh, dimension support so that we can leverage those time dimension and custom um, properties that we have in the database and advertise it in the capabilities document, allowing clients to do filtering. Filtering like, like this, where uh, we are saying, OK, give me this image with this time, this elevation, and these two custom dimensions. This is a somewhat uh, primitive filtering, if you want. But it's nice in that uh, it follows the specifications, so a compliant client can do this. If we want to do more, we can by using SQL filter. However, SQL filter is a vendor option, so we need a client that has been custom built to understand uh, the GeoServer WMS flavor. Here we are saying something like, yeah, OK, let's pick all images from Sentinel-2 and sort them by cloud cover uh, ascending or by time descending. And uh, well, the result changes because in one, we, we have few clouds. And in the other uh, one, we have more, more recent data, but with some clouds. It's also interesting that if we start from um, um, data like uh, elevation, uh, barometric pressure, and the like, we would like to, to do other kind of visualizations just other than just raster. Well, there are rendering transformations in the um, rendering engine that allow us, allows us to, to take the raster and on the fly extract contours, uh, wind, currents, and so on. And these few selected transformations have been designed to be fast. So they are actually uh, uh, interactive. Um, uh, we can also do on the fly algebra with, uh, with GIFL. So we can take, again, that uh, Sentinel-2 image with uh, 13 bands and uh, do NDVI calculations on the fly, or whatever you want, really. Also, we can download the data with WCS. With WCS, we can do a number of uh, interesting downloads based on time, based on space. And uh, uh, if we use uh, GeoServer-specific extensions, we can replicate what we just did with WMS and do SQL filtering and sorting so that we can literally visualize the image uh, with WMS and say, OK, I like this. Now I want the raw version of this and go to the WCS and download the same with the same parameters and filtering. However, there's a catch. WCS is synchronous. So it's not well suited to do uh, very large uh, extractions. 
However, we have another protocol in OGC, which is WPS, Web Processing Service, that allows for asynchronous requests. So we built a uh, download process that you can use to do large extractions. Large extractions like uh, having uh, an image mosaic of satellite takes of uh, North America and say, OK, I want a, um, a native resolution uh, download, which is probably going to take, I don't know, uh, half an hour to, to be processed and uh, delivered. You can do it with uh, the download service, wait some time on the asynchronous call, polling the server, asking, are you done? Are you done? And after a while, you might get uh, a very large GOT file at native resolution. But not only that, you can also ask for complex maps. Sometimes you wanted to apply rendering transformations and the like, and you wanted to get a very large uh, TIF uh, with uh, the results of a transformation. You can do that uh, with uh, the download process, and you can apply a style on top of it. And finally, since we have time, it's interesting to have uh, to, to create uh, animations based on time. So this is a Meteosat uh, set of images over the same area. And uh, through the WPS download, we can also ask the, the process to perform an animation over time of all the images and generate an MP4 file that we can, again, download sometime later when it's ready. So asynchronous. Uh, is helping us to perform the large extractions. And that is it. Any questions? Great. Thank you, Andrea. Very nice presentation. We have some questions. Uh, I will read it for you. <clears throat> Any thoughts on supporting Azure Blob Storage? Um, Azure Blob Storage can be supported. Uh, it's just a matter of getting enough development resources uh, on the back of it. So our first customers uh, needed S3. Now we have another customer that wants global, uh, sorry, Google Storage. So it's just a matter of uh, either uh, us getting uh, yet another customer that uh, is sponsoring Azure uh, Storage, Azure Blob Store uh, support or having some uh, external contributor that interfaces with the community and uh, uh, eventually does a pull request to contribute that, uh, that support. So yeah, uh, it, it can happen. There, there's no technical limitation. It's just a matter of uh, getting resources uh, on, on its back to get it done. OK, great. Thank you. There is another question. Uh, why, why is vector data not considered mentioned in the considerations of open search and stack? Is main metadata discovery filtering that much different? Well, uh, both services are targeting straight uh, raster data. Uh, and typically, uh, when, uh, when we talk about a product, uh, it comes with some uh, level of vector information, such as the masks, cloud masks, water masks, uh, uh, snow masks, and the like. And those are typically delivered deliver, via WFS. But the thing is, um, uh, for generic uh, vector uh, uh, search and uh, visualization and download, we already have a, a parallel set of generic services that could work, such as CSW for searching for the data, WMS and WFS for visualizing and downloading it. And the, the download process, I didn't mention it, but also works for vector data, and it allows to filter, clip, and uh, and then compress the, the output, uh, sorry, encode the output in shapefile or geopackage or something else. So there is a an already generic stack for, uh, for vector. Uh, Earth observation tends to have uh, their own uh, standards uh, that are focusing on the specific properties that you might find specifically for our earth observation. OK, great. Thank you. There is uh, another question. Was the well-established CKANAPI an option for downloading files? Um, sorry. <laughs> Can you write it down? Yes. <laughs> I will write it in our chat. Sorry. I don't like. Uh, Okay. 
Oh, Sorry. the Seekan uh, API. Okay, Seekan is a different kind of beast. Seekan tends, um, uh, it's it's an open data platform, right? And uh, you upload some uh, some data, and then you attach for download uh, information, and it's uh, completely generic. So um, again, it's it's a um, um, it's a difference between. Uh, Having something custom for Earth observation and Earth observation for EO and Stack, they both uh, spend uh, like 90% of their spec talking about uh, Earth observation properties and how you filter them and how you you work against them. Whilst Seekan is is completely generic, and um, I'm not very familiar with it, but I think that it supports a, a full text queries, but uh, it you cannot be as specific as with an open search catalog where you already have a list of properties that are in the standard. You know what uh, what they are, what their meaning is, and uh, you can build uh, this this way a very precise query. But out of that, yeah, um, I, I guess that C can also delivers a bunch of metadata and a bunch of links for download. So there is definitely a parallel there. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is. Uh, one more question. How does GeoServer handle stack extensions such as community extensions made to stack? Right. Um, uh, it does because we make everything customizable. So let me go back to this slide here. So the database that we have is uh, right now it's a PostgreSQL database, but it could be something else. Uh, there is an interface in between. It could be could, could be or could become an Elasticsearch or a Mongo or whatever. Now the thing is, um, the structure of the database is very simple. It has a collection table and a product table and so on, and uh, uh, the the set of properties that the 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 code recognizes is very small, sorry, not recognizes, but requires, is very small. But then it recognizes every other property that uh, uh, that you can, that you want to add, either in the collection or in the property or in the products. So for example, DLR has added a, a lot of properties which are specific to one or other collection, and they are added JSON fields where, uh, for example, the assets, the assets are contained in a JSON field or a JSON or a JSON B field. And, uh, and then everything downstream is, is built on templates. So you have the freedom to modify your database and then you go and modify your templates as well. And uh, uh, well, the query engine also uses a template to perform queries. So it's all dynamic. You can add whatever properties you want. And that's how we handle the, the extensions. You can just go and uh, edit both the database and the templates to support uh, the extension that you want. And uh, DLR uh, did that for a bunch of them. OK, thank you for that. Uh, we are on time. Uh, there is another question. Maybe if you have a very quick response. OK, are there performance concerns with GeoServer while using the WPS download? Any recommended configuration to keep the rest of the server performant? I copy it in the chat because it's a long uh, Right, so um, again, it's a good question. Uh, it depends on which, uh, which level of scalability you are aiming to. So if your production is relatively small, you can keep the WPS sitting on the same servers as everything else and you constrain its executions by using the service limits. So you can say no more than X request actually running, no more than uh, X megabytes of extraction. Uh, the, the download service has a bunch of service limits that you can impose. That's one way. Another way is to uh, use a, a, a router uh, um, or you know a load balancer to direct uh, WPS request to a bunch of other servers that only do that and still use the, the limits to, you know, avoid uh, those servers to uh, to die. Uh, the, the limits are set up so that you can, I, I don't know, say eight uh, concurrent requests are running and the others are queued and waiting for uh, enough processing power. So you have those two options, basically. Thank you very much. Yeah.
And now uh, we say goodbye to Andrea.